Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Robert Roseberry, pastor here at St. Paul's, and I'd like to thank you for joining us here at worship on this 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Here at St. Paul's, we seek to be a Christian community that affirms God's love by transforming lives, connecting generations, impacting our community and world, and making disciples for Jesus Christ. We pray that this platform here on YouTube is a good way for us to stay connected with each other while we're still out of touch physically in many respects. If you're signed into your Google or YouTube account, you should be able to participate in the group chat, which is live right now. In the chat screen, we can join in worship together. And since the video has been pre-recorded for today's service, I'm watching it with you and I can respond in real time in that chat window. Now, you might have received the prayer list in your mail or email this week. We're going to add names to it during prayer time when we can lift up our own prayers and praises in that chat window. If you're watching us for the first time and would like to know more about following Christ or just about St. Paul's, please contact me here at the church, and I'd love to set up a time to meet with you and uh, answer any of the questions you may have. So now that you're on our channel, go ahead and hit subscribe and the alert bell to get alerts about our channel or from our channel in the weeks ahead when we add new content here on YouTube. It's something we're always trying to do and we do on a regular basis. Now the church office during this time of COVID is open, but it's on a limited basis. The church staff are working remotely as much as possible. You're welcome still to call the church and, uh, and ask us on, on the phone or email if you need any assistance uh, or have any questions. We are still checking that email and voicemail, even when we're not here physically. Now, today we begin a sermon series based on the book, The Anatomy of Peace, Resolving the Heart of Conflict. This book, I think, speaks directly into our polarized and conflicted times. It reminds us that we often misunderstand the causes of our differences and disagreements, and then it shows us how to find true peace within ourselves and our relationships with each other. As followers of Christ, we are called to foster peace in the midst of evil, controversy, and conflict. So how do we cultivate a heart of peace when there's war all around us? We're going to discuss the book together on Facebook every Thursday at 5 o'clock while we're in the series. Those sessions on Facebook will be October 8th, 15th, 22nd, and the 29th. You're going to find this study on our Facebook page under Events. And um, you're welcome to invite your friends to join us, even if they aren't a part of St. Paul's. So let's dive into this powerful book during the next four weeks. And this powerful book can teach us how to be peacemakers during this time that is so difficult to make peace. Now, today's message is the first in that series. It's about how to cultivate a heart of peace. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to hear Jesus giving his followers a what at the time, and still today, I think, is a very controversial and revolutionary commandment. It's one so revolutionary that we still have a hard time following it today. So let's hear it as we open our hearts, our minds, and our Bibles in worship. Let's go to God in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Great Holy Spirit, be with us this morning as we worship, as we lift your name on high and reconnect to the great drama of your salvation that is playing out before us. Give us hearts this morning, not of stone, but of clay, so we may be molded by your word. Give us spirits of peace, love, and wisdom, not to make us wistful and weak, Lord, but strong enough to love our enemies, to pray for them and see them as the human beings they are. Help us to see that true strength does not lie in the power to coerce, but the power to heal and reconcile all things before you. Teach us this day, and may we be children of peace so we can be children of God. We pray this prayer in the name of your Son, the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Today's scripture is Matthew 5, 38 through 48. It is part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching his disciples many, many things. In this part we are reading today, Jesus is changing the Bible. He is taking some older parts of the Bible and saying, we're not doing it that way anymore. What? You can't just say, let's change what the Bible says. We can't change the Bible to make it say, parents, thou must take thy children out for hamburgers and fries whenever they want. The only one who could change the Bible would be God, or someone who has God's permission to change things. Hmm, who could that be? Jesus, of course. So what did Jesus change? There is a place in the Hebrew scripture that says that if one man hits another man and that man loses a tooth, his tribe can take a tooth from the man that did the hitting. Wow, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Why would the Bible say it's okay to take someone's tooth if they knocked out yours? But Jesus tells his disciples that they can do a lot better than the one tooth law. Here is the new law. If someone hits you, don't hit them back. Wow, that's harder than the one tooth rule. Jesus wants us as his disciples to be different. If a man gets hit, he doesn't do the same bad thing in return. As you grow the church and your parents will teach you many things about what God is like and about God's commandments. If you listen carefully, you will grow to be a person who does not want the bad per what the bad person does. Instead, you will follow what God says is best, and that will change your whole life. Let's pray. Hey God, help us to remember to not always return with anger. It is important that we work to make peace instead of continuing anger. That is what you would like us to do in order to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. A special thanks to our SP Kids assistants for their work on our children's sermon here every month as we do communion um, and their help throughout our children's ministry in this uh, time as we've tried to maintain our children's ministries and continue to um, grow them during this uncertain time. Uh, the SP Kids assistants, uh, Ari Ringer, CC Nelson, and Jordan Steffi have just been invaluable to us and I want to uh, thank them so much. Uh, they work behind the scenes in a lot of respects, but uh, we do, I, I do thank them so much, and I know you do too, uh, for all of their work during this time. They have been such a great help uh, to our children's ministries and to our church family. So as we continue our worship now through prayer, let me invite you, if you have a prayer request or a praise, to go ahead and type it in that chat window. And as you type them, I'll be adding the names that we already have on our weekly mailers prayer list. So in this way, we can truly see the prayers of the people as we add them to our conversation. Let's remember to pray, especially for those who are suffering from the effects of the coronavirus and those who, because of their occupations, are putting themselves at risk of catching this harmful virus in order for them to keep us protected and keep us safe. Let's also remember to pray for all those who are affected by natural disasters around our country, from the wildfires that continue to rage out west and to storms and hurricanes on the coasts and inland here uh, during this year of 2020. There are also people who can't join us online today. They are still isolated from their church family. So if you can think of someone you know who could use an extra check-in, please keep in touch with them and call them and make sure that they're okay during this time when we're a little more isolated, a lot more isolated than normal. So now let's join in praying together. And as we pray, you'll hear Santo, 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 which translated from Spanish means simply holy, holy, holy.
Lord, too often we say we want to do things, but we back away because we think things will be too tough for us. We don't believe that you'll be with us, guiding, healing, and strengthening us for service. So rather than doing your work, we just go through the motions. But the Bible states clearly that in you resides all hope, peace, and justice. Your love has been poured out on us and all creation from before the beginning of time. Teach us again, Lord, the great message of hope. Remind us that love is also risk. We risk censure and alienation from people who don't understand. Let us know that you are with us through this time. Give us courage to be your faithful witnesses by the kinds of loving service and care that we give to others. For this we ask in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. It's from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And um, as we read these powerful words from the, the core of of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I, I want us to really hear, Jesus is, is laying down some pretty amazing words here. And they're so powerful that, that we often struggle to implement them in our life. It sounds so simple, but um, what Jesus is talking about is something that all of us struggle with. And that's what we're gonna be um, talking about in the sermon today, but let's go ahead and read these words. It's chapter five in the Gospel of Matthew, verses 43 to 48. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So I hope we can hear in this passage um, God's desire really to perfect us in love to get all the love he can crammed into us so that we can be people who love everyone, even our neighbors. So um, before we, we go too far into the sermon, I do want to give credit where credit is due here. Um, Reverend Lisa DeGrenia, who is the pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in Bradenton, Florida, um, a, a wonderful pastor, a colleague of mine, and also um, someone I consider uh, a friend. She was just across town from me when I was serving in Gulfport at my first appointment. Um, she talked me off um, almost some ledges and um, really helped me to figure out um, a, a lot of things when, when I was just at my first church. And, you know, I learned a lot in seminary, but, you know, sometimes you still get to where you're going and don't quite know what to do. And she is someone who was also on a lot of the uh, the boards and committees as I was coming up through the ordination process, and she's someone I respect and, and admire deeply. Um, so as I was uh, looking up sermon series on the anatomy of peace, hers popped up, and as I read through it, I, I just said, well, this is this says it about as good as I could say it, probably better, since, uh, you know, uh, Lisa is Lisa, and uh, Reverend Lisa, Pastor Lisa, is someone who really does uh, exemplify a heart of peace, uh, you, you know, you talk to her and you just feel <laughs> uh, the stress leave you. She's just a really, really wonderful person in that regard. Um, and so I, I, I commend her um, her ministry to you. Uh, and also, um, a lot of this sermon series is inspired by uh, the work that she did and, and that she has already done. So I want to thank her and also let you know where a lot of this sermon uh, series is coming from. So... We live um, just an hour and a half, two hours away from a lot of theme parks, right? Um, we have all been in a theme park and seen um, things that just see things that just people get angry. Um, or we've been stuck in traffic. Um, we've been stuck on I-75 when there's a you know 40 car pileup, and um, 
you know, people get kind of, yeah, they get a little impatient. They get a little overreacted. Or maybe we've had to deal with difficult people in our family or in, in our work. Or maybe we've just had a kid that just won't listen. Maybe maybe we remember that we were that kid that just didn't listen. And, and we remember what the reactions of those around us were. Well, we all know what um, conflict and, and people in that heart of, of conflict and heart of war look like. And so today we're going to talk about the opposite. We're going to talk about um, a heart of peace. And I want you to think about those moments and maybe how you've reacted in some of those moments and, and whether your heart you were reacting from a heart of war or a heart of peace. Um, defining a heart of peace, right? Let's, let's go ahead and, and define what a heart of peace is before we get too far into things. Um, bishop Ken Carter, our bishop here in Florida, talks about what a heart of peace is, and he has a great quote I want to read to you. Um, a heart at peace is not about just being nice to another person. It's the refusal to exaggerate our differences and the refusal to go to war with another person. A heart of peace seeks to break the cycle that escalates our conflicts through working at the relational level, and it sees the other person as a person created in the image of God. So, real quickly, um, You've got the definition of a heart of peace. I want to show a diagram to you real quick uh, that comes from the book Anatomy of Peace. And, you know, above the dotted line is what we just talked about, what we see. It's the behavior. And it's it's what the person is doing or saying, um, what they're acting like. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, really. Below the surface is really where the behavior is born. It's our thoughts, our feelings, our wounds, our beliefs, our assumptions, and even our sin. They all color how we see the situation and how we see others. You know, that, that angry man or woman in the theme park or stuck in traffic in the car next to you. Um, you know, we see the frustration, the anger, the impatience, the overreacting. We see that. And that heart of war that... That, that, that the behavior that comes from the heart of war can lead to all kinds of destruction and oppression. Because, like we said before, a heart of peace sees the other person as human, and a heart of war doesn't. So if you're no longer a human being to me, I can take advantage of you. I can hurt you. I can oppress you. I can insult you. I can even enslave you. But in all of our reactions, there is another option. It's a heart of peace. It's when we see people as people, not as objects or obstacles or problems to be fixed. We're saying, you are real to me, as real as I am to myself. I see you. Your cares and concerns matter just as much as my own concerns do. I trust you and I, be I believe you. And this idea of seeing and valuing people comes straight from the first chapter of the Bible. When God creates us or creates all of humankind in his image, we're told that, that God said, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness. And on down in the passage, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You are made in the image of God. You and every person you meet. God's intention for you is goodness and wholeness, freedom and blessing. And God has the same intention for every person that you meet. Now, the permanent political season is in high gear, of course, with its you know ugliness and accusations. And man, it really kicked up a notch this week. Um, but as followers of Christ, we're called to foster peace in the midst of controversy and conflict and in the midst of, of evil. And this is inherently different than much of our political rhetoric especially when it becomes so exaggerated. And, and I want to make sure you heard that. The, the ugliness and the accusations that we see are directly opposed to the Spirit of Christ. People can make their points. They can state their views. They can even warn against something. But ugliness and accusations and name-calling, um, the exaggerated nature of the rhetoric, that's where the evil is at. Now, for instance, let me... Let me get a little personal here, but let's just take our church family, for example. If, if you are right of center, 
um, maybe you call yourself a conservative or, or whatever title you might take for yourself. Do you really believe that the Democrats here in your church family, and there are Democrats here in our church family, do, do you believe that they're really in league with violent socialist gangs who are trying to destroy America? I mean, do you really believe that they want their own country destroyed? Do you really think that they want babies to be killed or police to be assaulted and harassed? Do, do you really think that they want police departments stripped of their funding and somehow at the same time make uh, America a socialist police state? Now, if you're left of center, do you really believe that all Republicans are uh, here in your church family, the ones you sit or you sat in the pew with, the ones that are watching this YouTube video with? Do you really think that they're in league with racist and greedy corporate fear mongers? Do, do you really believe that they want America, America to go back to segregation? Do you really think that they would rather women weren't able to open a checking account or apply for a loan or, um, or, or a mortgage or even be the executor of an estate without a male cosigner? Do you really think that they all just blanket generally, you know, every single one of them are excited to go back to the 1950s when all these things that I just mentioned were the rules of the road back then in most places. Of course you don't think these things about the people in your church family. But, but how often do we, left, right, or center, or whatever, buy those stories that we're told? from those who would like us to like to see us at war with each other how often do we just assent passively to these influences and and the reason you don't think of think these things of the other side of the the political aisle in your church family is because you know these people right they're your church family you see them as people you don't see them as objects or as as boogeymen right and that kind of attitude that, that, that you have when you see people like that is when you have a heart at peace. And, and whatever our particular beliefs are about something, we can still have a heart at peace, a heart of peace towards someone else, towards anybody on whatever position they are or for whatever reason. And that heart at peace, as we saw in that diagram, it affects our behaviors because that is our way of being toward another person. It's how we are seeing that situation. And you know your church family, and so you see them in a different way than you might see uh, someone uh, who is uh, or some sort of political commercial. And how often do we just give in to the attitudes of other things and we believe the same thing about other people that aren't in our church family on the opposite side of whatever kind of issue? Now, how do we have a heart at peace? Right, that's the, the, the question here. How do we do that? Now, Psalm 34, 14 is a great guide to that. It's one little Bible verse. It's, it's simple to remember, and it is so helpful here. And that Bible verse, Psalm 34, 14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Simple. A lot of you might have even had that verse memorized. It's a very popular Bible verse. It's wonderful. And, you know, but what we've got to realize is that, you know, as we do that, as we try to leave that as we try to grow our heart of peace, we got to pray for the Holy Spirit. I mean, we cannot do this on our own strength. And, and you know, this is really about hearts of stone becoming hearts of flesh. It's about resisting pressure from an entire society that is bearing down on us and asking us to hate our sister or our brother. And resisting that is that's a work for God and it truly is a miracle and we need to lean on God and pray for that more and more Ezekiel 36 26 backs this up it says a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh God's will for you is not for you to have a hardened heart it's not for you to live with that heart of war. It's to give you that heart of flesh that sees people as people, that sees others as human beings and not things. So depart from evil, right? That's the per first part of the psalm. You know, ask God to reveal the ways you contribute to conflict and leave those ways behind. If you read in the Anatomy of Peace, you see how there's a, there's a whole collusion that we have where 
you know, and, and we'll get to this a little more in, in the following weeks, but, you know, we, we, there's this vicious cycle, you know, that somebody is, is at war with us, and so we respond in kind, and that leads them to think less of us, and so they respond in kind, and so we, it's just this terrible cycle, and we're, we're cooperating with each other. Why are we doing this? But it takes us to break that cycle. Ask God to reveal those things to you, the ways you contribute to conflict. Be honest with yourself and leave behind the people who are selling you the stories that make your heart go to war. Ask God to soften your heart to see the humanity of others. Pray for, for healing, for forgiveness, and strength to live a new life in Christ. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those on the other side of the aisle. Not that they would become like you, but pray for them. Pray for their families. Pray for the human stuff. Pray for their kids. Pray for the welfare of, of, of their spouse or whatever. Pray for those kind of things. And, and, and that is what helps us say, wait a minute, maybe they're actually a human being and not a thing that I can um, harass. The next thing we read is, is do good and seek peace. And, you know, I think so helpful to that is learn the stories of people of people on the other side of the issue, not the political story, just learn their life, learn, learn some things about them, learn, you know, find good things about that person and, and, and that person on the other side of an issue. And you will begin to see that person as a human being. Pursue these things, make an effort. Don't accept what others tell you. Don't accept just the rumors and the stories and intentionally learn new ways of being, intentionally learn new ways of, of, changing our behavior, new ways of behaving. And also, don't expose yourself, don't overexpose yourself to the polarization of one side or another. That is so easy nowadays. Instead, expose yourself to the things that are making peace. Don't be played by one side or another, or don't be played to one side or another. See both sides as human beings, not as objects. Reject speaking in, in the titles that remove the personhood from other people. You know, when we talk about those people, you know, don't speak in categories. Speak of people. Um, a, a good example, because I know this is kind of an abstract concept. A um, great example here at St. Paul's, you know, we, uh, we have neighborhood kids that ride their bikes and ride their skateboards around here all the time. Uh, they're all my, you know, I, uh, they're, they're here a lot, especially when the weather's great. And so... You know, they're here, they're riding their skateboards, they're skateboarding down the hill and, and, and having fun. And, you know, every once in a while, somebody gets a little rankered about something. Um, and, and, you know, we've had these meetings in, in trustees or in church council or whatnot, where somebody's like, well, what's happening here? And I think that they're doing something bad. And, and, and the, the words you hear are those kids. And it can come from any corner. I've, I know that I've even said it or thought it before. And, you know, those kids, right? And, and you know, something that always comes up in my heart, because I've seen it done the wrong way so many times at so many other churches, something that, that, I, that I've just found as a mantra that I try to always think is, what are their names? And what, what, what are their names? You know, and so don't, don't get mad at them until you know their names. Tell me which kids. And, you know, and, and so, and, and what we found here at St. Paul's, and this is, you know, a mindset that we've really, um, uh, tried hard and prayed hard to adopt with with our neighborhood people is you know they're people we learn their names and you know what happens when we learn their names and we get to know them and i'm not talking about sitting down with them for 20 minutes but we know their names and we say hello and we ask them how they're doing and we hey nice day outside glad you guys are here and just you know uh, create the friendliness link when we do that i want to tell you we do occasionally have instances here. This is an open campus. You have some things happen, uh, you know, some, some maybe light vandalism or things like that. And you know what? Um, I, I have uh, oftentimes when we are reacting to those situations, um, we'll talk to those kids and, and we'll say, hey, did you, you know, this, this happened the other day. Did you see anything? Have you seen anything odd around here? You know what? Those kids are watching out for our property. We didn't ask them to. We, we, you know, we don't, I mean, we sometimes do say, hey, can you watch? But, you know, they're, they're kids. They're, they're more worried about having fun than they are about policing our property. But because our hearts are at peace toward them, 
We have an entirely different relationship. And I have known churches, I have been a part of churches, regrettably, that have had the opposite mindset. And you know what? Nobody benefits from that. <laughs> when you're just at war, oh, those kids, and then, nothing good is going to happen. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. When you just speak in categories, oh, those Democrats, or the left, or the right, or um, that kind of thing is the language we really need to avoid because that objectifies people and that stops us from thinking of them as human. In cultivating peace in our hearts, we should see people as people made in the image of God. We, sh we should look below the surface to really see what is going on. We need to break that cycle of escalation. We need to say, the war stops with me. And we need to choose carefully how to respond. And, you know, help the situation. Do good instead. And the next time you think of an issue or a person on the other side of an issue, think of them as people. What are their names? Who are their parents? Um, you know, what? maybe they've had a medical problem that you've had, too. Maybe they've struggled with cancer. Maybe they've um, struggled with something else. And, and, you know, what are they thinking about in the carpool line or the grocery store? You know, who are their kids? The basic, the basic thing that can help us have a heart of peace is that no one is the pure evil we're told they are when, when folks work in categories like that. Instead, we're all human beings. We're all folks, you know, we're individuals. We have some good, we have some evil we're struggling with, and all of that is imperfect. You, me, and everybody else. And if we live like these facts are true, then we will have a heart of peace for others. And we'll find that we get into a whole lot less conflict with others. And as a result of that, we will live a richer, more holy life. And that, I think, is what we all want, right? I could use a richer and more holy life. I don't know about you. And a heart at peace helps us to see the opportunities for love that God has for us. So just like Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. May that be so for me, for you, and for the whole world. Amen. During these Sundays after Pentecost, we boldly claim the gift of new and eternal life given to us through faith in Jesus Christ. Today on World Communion Sunday, we celebrate and affirm the worldwide nature of the church and pray for all of our Christian sisters and brothers everywhere who are worshiping and sharing in Holy Communion today. God made us all in love at the beginning of creation. And when we fell into sin and became controlled by evil and death, God's love remained steadfast. God delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign Lord, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. It is because of that deliverance that we can celebrate the resurrection and the work of the Holy Spirit with joy. This is the same Holy Spirit that unites all of humanity, regardless of nationhood, racial or ethnic identity, gender identity, or anything else, into the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom is made real as we are all brought to new life in Jesus Christ. Because of the circumstances of social distancing, our communion will look differently than it usually does. We are having communion at our in-person service at nine o'clock, but we're still de dealing with the danger of COVID-19, and it's not entirely safe to gather together as an entire congregation. But regardless of how different the table and the elements may look this Sunday in your home, God's grace is still just as powerful. During communion, we lift up the bread and the cup of grape juice or wine as the elements of this holy sacrament. So whatever you have with you that can represent the bread and the cup, you're welcome to use them to be the elements of holy communion today. While you hear the next piece of music, let me invite you to gather the communion elements from your home so we might share in this holy meal together.
together on a Just as we've gathered the elements, let's also prepare our hearts to receive God's grace, knowing that the favor God shows us is not earned, but it's given as a gift. His grace is present as we participate in this sacrificial meal that he shared with his disciples. The Lord be with you. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who sincerely repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Holy are you, God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born new to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfailing. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He, and he said, after he gave it to his disciples, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day that he raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
let this bread that we eat be a sharing in the body of Christ. Now everyone, please take your bread and let's eat it together to signify our unity in Christ. Because this is the body of Christ, broken for you. be a sharing in the blood of Christ. Now drink from your cup, because this is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Let's join together in the prayer after receiving as we prepare our hearts to take the sacrifice of Christ out into the world. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. While we are in different times, and we're working differently, of course, uh, the work of the church still does continue in that different way. We're still bringing people the good news of Christ just in new and different ways. And even though this worship is online, you can still give your gifts to St. Paul's. You're welcome to mail your checks into the church this week. Our address is 800 Southeast 41st Avenue, Ocala, Florida, 34471. You can also go to our website, which is spocala.org slash giving. If you're already on our homepage, just click on the word giving that you see in the toolbar. And there you can find instructions on how to sign up for electronic giving. This can be a one-time gift, or you can sign up for regular giving straight from your checking account. The third option is to hit the donate button on our Facebook page, and following those instructions there, you can make your gift as well on Facebook. Thank you for your support of God's work through St. Paul's. Would you please join me in prayer as we bless our offerings this morning with a prayer that is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi which is found on page 481 of your hymnals, if you have one with you. Let us pray. Lord, with these gifts, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is an injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we do receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Our closing hymn today is a rather famous one in Methodist circles. It's the first hymn in your hymnal, if you have it with you, number 57, For a Thousand Tongues to Sing. The title comes from a conversation that Charles Wesley, John's brother, had with Peter Bowler, uh, their mutual Moravian friend that helps to lead them both into a deeper faith. And one day, as the two were talking, Peter said to Charles, If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise Christ with them all. And that quip to his friend inspired the first line of this classic hymn. It's written to celebrate the one-year anniversary of Charles's conversion to Christianity. And as we sing it, we stand with the angels before the throne of God, lifting our voice as one church to glorify the one who, in the words of this hymn, bids our sorrows cease. And as... We sing that. We also sing in the knowledge that the kingdom of God is not yet fully realized. We do proclaim Christ's victory as a declaration of hope that we will see Christ reign over all. And in doing so, we stand with the voiceless, the lame, the prisoner, the powerless, and those in deep sorrow, still lifting our song of hope. So would you sing along with me in this hymn of praise and wonder?
Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name of fears that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of counsel sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. As we close worship today, let me thank you all for joining us. Thank you to all the staff and volunteers who have helped make our ministry and worship possible during these challenging times. We're going to worship together like this next week at the same time and the same place here on YouTube. And we'll also be in the church sanctuary at 9 a.m. to worship in person here on the church campus. If you'd like to come to our in-person indoor service, please register for it at cometoworship.org. Today was our first service inside the sanctuary since March, and we're already learning how we can do things better. I want to mention something about registrations that we didn't really think to mention uh, before our first service. And that's that registrations help us to plan for capacity here in the sanctuary. And everyone who's coming into the sanctuary on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for our worship service should register. Because you're going to be in the same air circulation system as everyone else in this large room. But if you have some little ones with you who will be heading down to the fellowship hall for SP Kids Church or iClub, um, you don't have to register them for the Sunday service because they won't be in the sanctuary. They'll get signed in when they get to SP Kids Children's Church. Now, as the trustees approve ministries to get up and start it again, we're hoping and praying that everyone in Marion County is careful and stays healthy. We're going to do our best to make sure the virus does not spread from our church family. If you'd like to volunteer to be one of our covenant keepers, please call or email the church office and let us know. These are the people who will greet folks as they come in to worship at 9 a.m. Uh, they'll sign them in and do a temperature check as they come into the narthex. And then they'll also welcome folks into the sanctuary. Um, and covenant keepers are really an important way we can make sure everyone has a good experience and knows what to expect as they come to church on Sunday. This way of doing church that we're going to be doing indoors here uh, is very different, and we understand that. And we want to make sure that um, people are guided as they come in so that um, nobody feels like they don't know what to do or where to go or anything like that. Now, continuing on in our sermon series today, we're going to discuss the anatomy of peace together on Facebook every Thursday at 5 o'clock while we're in the series. Those sessions, once again, are on October 8th. 15th, 22nd, and 29th. You'll find this study on our Facebook page under events, and you're welcome to invite your friends to join us whether they're a part of St. Paul's or not. Uh, when you purchase the book, make sure that you get the expanded second edition that is written by the Arbinger Institute. That's the one we'll be using for the series. I hope this worship has blessed you this morning, and as we depart these virtual doors, would you please receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Is
light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine Everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine 